Um, well, I want to thank Leif for giving a very good, thorough overview of things. Uh, I think he explained pretty well what meatloaf is. I was going to do some of that, but thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I will go through my slides just really quick. And I, I think what I want to do in this presentation is just show some of the some of the ways to get data into meatloaf. Or, or data into the 64 using the meatloaf device. Um, let's see. Uh, slides. It's, uh, he talked about FujiNet. Um, I um, I found the FujiNet guys when I after I'd been working on meatloaf for a while and discovered that we were both pretty much working on the same project, so we kind of joined forces. They had already been going for a good while and they were working together as a team whereas I was just kind of by myself working on this for the 64 by by myself so I wasn't making as much progress or or well the progress was slow this was during COVID whenever I started working on this um so I um I found them and and jumped in and um, took over the handling all of the Commodore stuff. That's kind of that's kind of how we got um, how we kind of met up. Um, Tom had posted something on one of the Facebook Commodore groups talking about FujiNet and what they were doing, and asked if anyone was interested in helping. And that's whenever I I I, I saw the message and read everything about FujiNet and jumped into their Discord and was like, hey, I'm already working on this. So anyway, um, we're sharing code. Uh, Leaf mentioned that as well. I've written a lot or written all of the IEC code and um, and and also I've got someone work that has been working with me some, um, actually a good bit, uh, Pashemik, he's in Poland, and he did some magic with the Meatloaf library for just like doing streams within streams within streams. It's uh, some pretty cool stuff, and I'll show that to you here in just a bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, the differences between Meatloaf versus SD to IEC and Pi 1541 is that uh, Meatloaf doesn't just simulate a single device. It can... it can simulate multiple devices and um, just like a stack of floppies, virtual printers. Um, it's not going to, the plan isn't to be in a cycle exact 1541. I'm sorry, I should be, let me switch to the slides here. I'm looking at them, but <laughs> I wasn't showing them on the, on the display. So anyway, uh, the goal is not to be cycle exact, but I do have some ideas for meatloaf to make it more compatible with some of the some of the demos and the tricks that people do to, um, you know, to get get really cool effects. And um, so I've got to I've, you know, I've got some ideas. <laughs> uh, loading loading software with meatloaf, of course, you can load data straight from Flash. You can load from an SD card that's local to the system. Uh, we built in um, a URL loader. So you can have a list or a bunch of small files with URLs with them stored on the Flash memory inside the, the, the ESP32. So it's got about 16 megs of Flash. Uh, a portion of that's available for a Flash file system. And URLs take, a lot, take up a lot less space than a full PRG file. Since we're connected to the internet, we could have a bunch of URL files that just point directly to things out on the internet. You, you can load that URL file, it reads the URL and then goes directly out on the net to, to load that program into memory. Um, of course, you can direct load a URL. You can type in the entire URL and load it up. And um, also we've, created these ML short codes, and I'm gonna have a web interface and a portal so that people can register their own short codes to use within Meatloaf and share those with their friends. Some, some of these URLs have, may or may not have characters in them that can't really type on a Commodore 64 keyboard. And 
also the URLs get pretty long. So these short codes will help with sharing stuff a lot. Yeah. Uh, I also wrote a browser add-on that works in all of the major browsers. It's called Send the Meatloaf. And I'm going to show that to you as well. So what happens is your meatloaf device is on your Wi-Fi. I'm assuming also that your computer is on the same Wi-Fi. And when you're browsing, you find a PRG or a, or a D64 file that you want to load up on your real 64. You just right-click on it in your browser, select Send the Meatloaf. It queues the URL up in the um, API on the server, and then you enter a command, just ML colon star. It hits the server, grabs that URL, and then directly goes out and pulls that URL down um, or and you know loads it on your 64. I'll show that here in just a second too. Um, URLs. Um, a moment ago, I was talking about how we can have streams within streams within streams. That is, um, this is, this kind of demonstrates that the URL can be not just HTTP, but we could have direct TCP connection or other protocols that go out and search, you know, hit a file, which don't have archive support yet, but that's coming. So you could have a D64 inside of a zip and load a file from a D64 inside of a zip on, on a web server. So that's kind of the whole idea. The, um, the library that uh, Shamik wrote makes this really easy. You just pass a, um, you just pass this long URL to the, um, to the library and it does all of the magic and unwraps it all, returns a stream and then sends it right over to the 64. So. Let's see. I'm gonna um let's go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and just start showing you some of this stuff. So um first let's just do a direct load from a URL. Everyone's familiar with loading from SD or flash, or whatever. So I'm just gonna do load HPD slash slash C64. Uh, CC and I'm going to load I'm going to load the um. well let's just load uh, I'm going to do this game of the day it's really not a game of the day because I haven't changed this file out in a long long time it's it's same program same game you can see it loading here this is the serial monitor. I've got the uh, Meatloaf device connected to my MacBook, and in Visual Studio Code, we're monitoring the um, the output from the device while it's running, just for debug purposes. And it's kind of cool to watch this this stream. I've got the data stream turned on so that you can see the memory address that it's loading into on the 64. So after I'm after I'm done loading here, I could go into a machine language monitor and look at those locations in memory and see that that data is correct. So there we go. So we got uh, we got that loaded. I'm going to run. And boom, there we go. It loaded up, digged up. So on the server, the plan is to have a um, script, a game of the day script, so that you can load it. it, it so that it will switch out the game on a daily basis. This was just one of the ideas that I had for for making this fun. So you can load up the game of the day on your Commodore 64 with your meatloaf device real easy. And also, instead of typing out that big long URL, we can use a short code, which is code. All of the short codes start with ML for meatloaf, colon, G O T D. And instead of typing out that big long URL, we can enter that and hit the API, it gets the direct URL and starts loading. And it is slow right now, of course, because it's standard IEC serial speeds. Um, we've mentioned that I am working on fast loader support. 
Uh, I wanted to have Jiffy DOS done last year, but I've been having issues with the uh, IEC protocol and most of my time has been spent just troubleshooting that. And I've got it pretty solid right now. There we go. Um, and Jamie, Irvin, do you mind if we ask questions? Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. I'm just wondering, are you taking the stream from the internet and dumping it right directly to the IEC bus? Or are you kind of caching it on the card it or on the... It's not caching anything. Everything is a direct, um, it, it buffers a little bit, but it doesn't cache the whole file or anything. And I will show you that in just a moment too. Whenever we start, I, I can, can, stream, can stream load data from a D64 sitting on a web server. <laughs> so it doesn't take up a whole lot of memory on the, on the, um, the ESP32. So we can hit a um, a hard disk image out on a web server and jump around inside that image and load load files from it. Right, that makes sense. So I was just thinking, like, it, it would it be quick? I, I I know going over the bus would be really uh, slow, that the four hundred uh, bytes per second kind of deal. But I'm just wondering, like, if you just downloaded it right to the card and then just streamed it out that way. But I guess throwing uh, Megan a bit at it, it'd be a little too much, yeah. I guess. Well, well, also, um, um, I didn't want to wear out the flash memory of the ESP. And if we're caching it to flash, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we've got enough, we've got enough ESRAM to cache maybe a D64 image or, or, or several. And there's actually four megs of ESRAM, a bankable ESRAM that is not even being used at the moment. But when you get into emulating multiple drives, multiple um, floppy drives, um, then caching it in memory isn't, you know, you start running at, like if you're caching five disks, then you're running out of memory fast. And so streaming it just makes sense. And we can read from a web server faster than we can send to IEC. So it's not a big deal, really. I suppose. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So um, let's see. Um, oh, let's do this. I'm going to show you. Let's go to. HDMI. I'm gonna um well let's switch. let's load. I'm gonna do another short code ML colon FB64. And this is gonna load file browser 64 right from the meatloaf server. I'll show you. And then the URL gets set based on the um the, the base URL gets set by it's the URL that you currently load. So if I loaded that, I loaded that FB64 from the server. So whenever I run it here, it's going to make a request to the server. I've got a PHP script on the server that will return a directory listing in a binary um, C64 PRG file format. So it just returned this directory listing, as you can see up there. This is this is the these are the files on the server. So I'm going to browse around the server. Say, um, well, I've got a, I've got a um, directory here called profile, and this is where I want to keep, like, want people to be able to register their own profile, and that profile can link over to their server, so you can set up your own meatloaf server wherever you want on the internet, just using my little PHP script, throw some files up there, and you're good to go. And then um, when you register it, you'll be able to register it at meatloaf.cc so that it's browsable. So whenever you come in here, you'll be able to like click on one of these and it would it would go directly over to your server. So I'm gonna load, let's see, let's do a read. This is a good one. We're gonna do we've got SATA wing two here. This is a D64 image, and this is sitting on the meatloaf.cc website. So it's getting a directory listing there. And it just what you saw in the in the stream, in the data stream behind there is um the first thing that it did is it opened it opened the um the URL there to the file, and then it got a directory listing by 
seeking around inside the image to track 18 to build this, to get the data for the directory listing. So now we're in the directory listing. We're going to go down and we're going to, oops, load the first file here. Now it's, now, now it's seeking within the image to, to count all of the blocks to figure out how big the file is. And it's going pretty fast. Um, there are some things that we can do to improve this. Again, it's seeking using range headers on HTTP to figure out how big this file is. And it's parsing the D64 on the fly. And now it's loading a block at a time from the server into the memory of the 64. And this is gonna take a little while, sorry. <laughs> Anyone got any questions while this is loading? How'd you come up with that name? Yeah, sorry, I, I missed the oh, beginning. Yeah. What's meatloaf about the <laughs> Oh, okay, well, um, when I first started working on the device, I didn't really have a name for it. Um, I initially started calling it ESP to IEC and, you know, kind of in the spirit of SD to IEC or 51541 or something like that. And I really didn't, I really didn't want a name that described, that defined what the device was. And I was thinking about everything that it could do. And I'm like, you know, in my brain, I'm thinking, well, it'll do that and it will do that and it'll do that. And then when I started thinking about the expansion port, I'm like, well, it won't do that. And then that meatloaf song started playing in my brain. <laughs> I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> meatloaf became the name. What a reason is any. <laughs> so all right it's almost done loading again and this is straining a d64 image sitting on a web server and loading the files directly you know i'm gonna hit space this is a cracked version of this program i do actually own it i um really love her software And here we go. Hit space. It's going to load another file off the server. Oh, shoot. And it's going to fail on me <laughs> right in the middle of the demo. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. I have to reset. Well, How can you tell that it's failing? Um, it was reading somehow. It was trying to read tracks that were that do not exist. <laughs> you can see that in the uh, in the little data stream there. All right, let's try again, or right, we can try something. We can try something else. Well, okay. Yeah, I'll try one more. Let's do uh, ML FD64. We'll load up the file browser again. Let's see. I'm do. Use this one a lot for testing just because it loads up a lot of stuff. And this is a D81 image. I went a little nutso on the media file formats. I I have a lot of fun digging in and figuring out how the, the files are laid out. The D64, D71, D81. Um, so I'm trying to support every media file format that was ever created for Commodore. It already supports D80, um, D82, 
DMT, um, T64. Um, I'm treating TCRT files like a file system so that you can load things out of it. Um, also support the backbit D8D file format. And there's a D90 format for some hard disk images that's for the uh, 9060 and 9090 drives. I, I, I have support for that in here, but I don't have, I don't know if it works completely because I don't have any sample images with data in them. I've got some blank images. So if anyone has any sample disk images for any file format that was ever created, the, the more obscure ones, please, um, you know, send those to me if you don't mind sharing. There we go. We're loading um, Ultima 3 from a D81 disk image sitting out on the net. I don't know why the Zeta Wing 2 failed. But, and it might load just fine on the second try. It could have just been a, a glitch in my internet connection. <laughs> Oh, I'm just going to load a little bit more. We really need some kind of visual feedback on the device to let you know what it's doing. Oh, you know what? I think I might have um, been mistaken on the other one. It may have been seeking to... Um, no, it messed up. It did mess up. Got to find a better way to do this because it's um, seeking around to find out how big the file is before it actually starts loading it. So it has to look at each individual sector because you can't trust the like in the directory listing, it tells you it's a certain number of blocks, but that could be a lie. You could it could say one block and load twenty, or it could say twenty blocks and there only be four. It doesn't have anything to do with the actual length of the file. So I follow the track sector links across the disk image and calculate the actual file size before I actually start loading it. The D71 file format, I believe, fixes that. There's a couple extra bytes that are used or something. Like the number of the number of blocks plus oh there we go. Insert scenario this. Hit space. Load the last little bit here. And then there we go. They're all loaded up. <laughs> all right, I'm going to reset this. Okay. Um, any questions so far? No? <laughs> okay, I want, I was going to, I, I had, had an idea. Um, me and uh, Shame were working on a basic demo, and I will show you. Let's load it up. Uh, one, two, two, two. So I mentioned this during Leaf's presentation, and started working on this yesterday thinking it would be great to get it finished so we could demo it today. And um, I'm still having some issues with it, but this is a, uh, and I'll show you, it, it's not doing a post request like it should be. And uh, I think there's something, there, there's there's something being translated wrong in the, in the command and I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, the command to the network adapter 
and I'll show you. It's doing a get instead of a post, right? You can see it. It built this JSON query. You can't, there aren't curly braces on 64, so you can't it just use these other characters. You can't see that. And if we scroll back, you can see that it made a request, but it did not post the it did not post the request and it didn't specify the the headers, the J, the HTTP headers that it needs to authorize the request. So I am going to um, I'm going to have to work on this and finish it later. But I wanted to show um, a demo of using, you know, writing something. We can do a GET request just fine. So let's, while, while Leaf was talking, you guys started talking about other APIs. And I was like, well, maybe we can, maybe there's an API out there that we can use to do a, a live demo. I haven't, haven't used this API before. But I, while Leaf was doing his demo, I searched over here on Google, or well, this is the uh, DuckDuckGo, and I found just search for JSON APIs quote of the day API, and they have a simple API, and I figured to show you how this works. Let's go down to. Um, sample requests make that a um, quote generates 50. We don't need 50 quotes, we just want the quote of this to be the quote of the day. There you go. So, this URL, and we are going to we will write this on the fly right now <laughs> and see how, see how this goes. Uh, Let's go to VS Code. I don't know if you guys can see this okay. It might be better on that big screen. Um, so, good examples. Find another folder here. Folder. Send quotes. Oh. Oh, it's write this. I mean, we could write this on the 64. I'm going to do it here in Visual Studio Code because it'll be a little bit faster. Let's see. I'm going to use. I wrote. I wrote one as an example. This is the um, the basic. I was going to show this, but I'm like, I don't know if I want to give out my IP to everyone, <laughs> especially if this is going to be recorded in a video and I've got a static IP. But uh, this is pretty simple. So I'm going to copy this over. We're going to modify it. This is in quotes, paste. Okay. So we're going to change out the the API URL to this one. Copy it. And I'll show you how easy it is to work with this uh, API for doing data. Okay, send quote uh, IO API today. Um, we're going to tell it to parse, and we want first we want to get we're going to get um, so based on parse two tells tells the meatloaf device or so, sorry, tells the network adapter that we're going to parse this request. And then um, this command, this, this sets the, J, the JSON query on channel two. So we're sending this to, we're sending the, these commands to channel 15 of the network device. So we open channel 15. The network device is device ID number 12 right now. And we're opening a secondary channel for the IP. So we've got, or for the URL, this actually creates the, the network connection. And then we're telling, we're telling it on the command channel that we're gonna parse, tell it to parse the JSON 
and then we then we're going to tell it which value we want right now. So we've got JSON, JQ, JSON query, channel two, and this API we've got it uses kind of a a, a path through the the JSON file to specify what key to to use to grab the value from. So we're going to do Q for that's the quote. We're going to put that into Q. And then, oops. And then we'll also grab the um, point number 15. We'll get the author too. JQ, comma two, comma, and it is slash A for author. That's the path for the author. Five input number two comma a other side and then down here we'll put come to quote then three points Okay. Maybe we want to turn it to the line between the two. Yeah, let's just leave that. Okay, so let's compile this. And I'm using Visual Studio Code and plug in here or an extension C64 basic v2. And convert that. Let's spit out a Let's get out as eq.das file. So I'm going to switch over to that to my browser window over here. We've got I've got a connection open to the meatloaf server. So I'm going to go in Zen quotes here. Oh no, hold on. We're going to in folder cq.base. I'm going to drag that. I'm going to transfer that. To the server. Come on. There we go. Uploaded. Now we're going to go here and we're going to load ML colon C Q Q comma eight. Yeah, that should be a basic program. Oh. Okay. Uh, again. Yeah, it should matter. It should grab the first thing that it matches. Is that file in? Sorry, it might not have compiled. No, it's only four bytes. Okay, um, it did not compile properly. So we have an error here, hang on. Next code. That is our problem. Put two Q. But it's not, hmm, it's only four bytes. It should be bigger than that. Oh. Okay. Oh. Hi guys. 
only convert it. In here, so sources. See, let's see if they give me a bigger file. Oh, yeah, okay, that's bigger. All right, that should work. Let's go code. Let me switch that over to here. This compiled here. Oh no, that other one's 300. Okay, well, it did compile it the second time. That's weird. Okay, delete. Thank you. There we go, 969 bytes. That looks better. All right, let's see if that loads up. Okay. That loaded. Now, let's do my own test. No, it did not load. Sorry. I don't think I converted that right. The transfer. There we go. Okay, it compiled this time. I don't know what the deal is. Let's see that I did not enter the pet cat command properly. Let's see if that did not work. Okay. Transferring it again. This time it's 271 bytes, which that sounds more like the right size. 271 bytes, okay, all right. Let's reset. And I'll turn to the wait. There we go. Here's our program. All right. <laughs> now let's see if we get the quote of the day when we run it. Oh, I put dollar sign A, duh, instead of A dollar sign. That's probably why I didn't compile the first time. Okay, one. <laughs> Good night.
Oh, look, it actually got the quote. It's just not parsing it out correctly. So, there's something wrong with my command to parse. Oh. This one is you. Okay, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not working, um, but it's close. As you can see, it is it is pulling the quote from the server. It's just not parsing it out, and this may be related to some of the issues that I was having earlier. Although the, um, the my IP one did work, but I did make some changes to just before. Just before. Um, I um, started the presentation earlier. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave it at that for right now. I apologize. But it is really, really easy when it's working right. I've, I've, I've messed something up in the code, <laughs> in the, in the firmware on my, on my Meatloaf device, which I will get corrected. So. Is there anything else I can show you guys or anything you want to talk about? Absolutely. I'm sorry. So I have a question. If I want to build one, do I literally just need an ESP32 board and a DIN connector? Like no uh, other circuitry? Yes, that yeah. that's pretty much it. Here I'll show you the um here minimum device. That's the original device. I originally started with an ESP8266 and that uh level shifter was not needed if you only have this one device on the on the system. And I did have a parallel interface because I originally I started with the you know the building a Wi-Fi modem and then it's like, well, even though I have a Wi-Fi modem, I don't have the software that I need to run the modem, you know, CCGMS. And there were some extra pins available. So I thought maybe I could just build an IEC interface onto the same module because it's fast enough. And this, this ESP8266 has 16 megs of flash on it, which is plenty enough room to store a lot of PRG files. So that's what I started with. The whole idea was to have one tiny little device that you could plug in both into the user port and the IEC port and load all the software that you need off of it to run the to run the modem. And you don't need a you know, you don't need a floppy drive, you don't need anything else, you just need the one device. Then after that, I got to thinking it was like, well, if I could load D64 images off of the flash, that would be great too. So I started working on that. And then later it's like, well, maybe we can load these 64s off of the web server or peer. Actually, it started with PRG files off of the web server. And then, and then we got into, I got into the file formats and parsing these 64s. And that does work on the ESP8266. And it actually may work better now, but I was starting to hit some limits of the, the memory, things like that. And I was running into, um, running out of memory on some things, but I have optimized stuffs and I haven't back ported the code to the 8266 yet, but I kind of want to do that just to see if it will still work on the 8266. So anyway, back to your question, the Lowland D32 Pro is the module that I recommend because it has 60 megs of flash, has eight megs of PS RAM, it also got a little SD card slot on the side. Literally, all you have to do is wire up six wires to it to a DIN plug to plug into the back of the 64 and that's that's the bare minimum that you need to get going it will work with the uh room modules the uh the room 32 or uh, those only have four megs of 
four megs of flash and no PS RAM, and it will work on that right now, but there's not a lot of room to grow on that module. But if that's all you have on hand right now, you can you can build this and get going inside the um the firmware. Let me show you VS Code. Everything is configured in the platform IO INI file. So when you load up the project, there's a sample version of this file called platform io.ini.sample. And you just make a copy of it, save it as platform io.ini, and then you come in here and you change some settings. First, you tell it what board you have. I'm using the um the Fuji Loaf, which is a prototype board. Let me show you, I'll show you a picture of that real quick. This is one that Moswald built after him and I went back and forth um, on the design for a while. And then he laid all this out and it looks it looks awesome. It has all of the all of the ideas that I was having about what I wanted the final device to be. Um, it's got everything in here. Some things have not been tested yet, like the it's got a parallel interface for the US for the user port, as well as a serial interface. You can switch between parallel and serial mode. And also added some here on the the board on the, 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 the view on the left-hand side, it's got five LEDs, RGB LEDs across the top that are gonna be programmable, but also give us some kind of visual feedback when loading something. You can show light up an LED for every 20% of the program that's loaded. So that's kind of, you know, it's kind of annoying not knowing how long it's going to take to finish loading the program if you're not looking at the serial monitor. And then on the, the view on the right, on the top left, you've got two buttons there. One is a reset and one is a um, just an auxiliary button for doing other things that I haven't decided on yet. And then just below that, that's a um, that's a headphone jack. And the idea, there's a DSP or a DAC on the um, a DAC on the ESP32. The idea was to feed audio out and in through the audio input on the video connector, so we could mix with the um, mix with the SID and actually do some like stream an MP3 along through with your SID music or something like that. I don't know, just ideas. Not a lot of people, not a lot of devices have utilized that audio in on the 64 and I was kind of wanting to put it to use. But the um the parallel interface, I plan for it to be compatible with like Wix64 and Speed DOS and all of those different things too. So um okay, back over to VS Code. When you start up the project, you make a copy of platform io.ini, and then you come in here and you edit a few things based on the board that you're using. I'm using the Fuji Loaf. The second board in the list is the Lowland D32 Pro. There's a TTGO T1, and then here's the uh, ESP32 Room, if you have one of those modules. And then someone also made an interface for Pi1541 hat using an ESP32 Room as the interface instead of an actual Raspberry Pi. And there's a configuration for that in here as well. Um, so once you select that, you come down here and you select how much flash memory you have on the system, 16, eight or four megs. And then um, you can set your default Wi-Fi cred credentials in this file as well. And then you, um, you compile it and flash it to your ESP32 and you should be good to go. The um the pins for wiring everything up are in uh, under include. Go under include. There's a pin map, and then based on your device, like the uh, Lowland D32 Pro, you look in this header file. Scroll down to the bottom. Um, these are these are the pins that you wire up for reset ATN. Clock in, clock out are the same, and data in, data out are the same because we're not splitting the lines on this one. And then the SRQ line, you want that SRQ line um, wired up as well. I didn't even I didn't show you that, and I don't think it's going to work properly either. So I'm having issues with it. You can try real quick. Let's see, 
there is a Petsky term that Tom wrote. And we use the SRQ line, an interrupt on the SRQ line to tell the 64 that we have data weighting. That SRQ line wasn't really used on anything on the 64. And um, we're putting it to use here. So let's see, let's load. Oh, no, I'm going to turn. I think all of my stuff is going to work. <laughs> so, five minute warning? Five minute warning. Okay. We'll try this real quick and then um, we'll be done. We'll be done. It's probably going to fail because I'm still having issues with some of this stuff. But we're doing um, kind of like modem type access over the IEC port. Yeah. Well, there you go, it actually worked. So we just we just did a telnet connection to this VBS and loaded that, that data over the IEC port, not the user port or the expansion port, right over IEC. So we can do like modem type functionality right over IEC. So I'm gonna hit, uh, let's see if gallery's gonna work. Well, it's actually working, how about that? Let's do a, we're gonna do, oh, let's do slideshow on. Yeah, let's hit eight. There you go. Kind of cool. So again, that's all going over IEC. It's gonna load the next one here in a second. There you go. And then it looks beautiful. This was not working earlier whenever I tested it, and I wasn't sure I was going to even try to show it. There we go. And that uh, that Petsky term is really not a very big program at all. It's also written in um, C, and it's available in the FujiNet apps repo on GitHub. And Tom wrote this and it it's pretty pretty dang awesome. So I guess that is it for me. Cool. Thanks for letting me present. <laughs> I hope I covered some cool stuff. Um, and this is going to get better. Again, we're still working on a lot of things and it's um and have a lot of ideas for more for more in the future too. So. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you.